Hello my friends, and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 guide. Hope you're all doing well. Today we're talking about something incredibly important that's almost never discussed. I'm in the mood to complain a little bit, and so we're going to be visiting one of my personal hobby horses, tooltips. In a game as large as Baldur's Gate 3, it's very important that the game be clear about what everything does. There are tens of thousands of moving pieces and literally quadrillions of possible interactions, and so having clear descriptions for what things actually do is very important. Unfortunately, sometimes the game just lies to the player, and that can very easily confuse people. I do a lot of Baldur's Gate videos and get to read a lot of Baldur's Gate comments, so I'm in a very good position to know what people are generally confused about, and often it's not their fault, because sometimes the game will just mislead the player by including completely incorrect information in the tooltips. Whether or not these get fixed, I think it's very worth going over them, because these are such common points of confusion for players that it can really help you understand how the game actually works if you realize when the tooltips are misleading, uh, inaccurate, or just straight up wrong. Sometimes they're just wrong um, both by, by including incorrect information or even just incorrect numbers. Um, and so we're going to go over five of the ones that I see confusing people most often, plus an honorable mention, talk about what the game says they do, and then what they actually do, and then demonstrate what happens when you actually use them in the game, so that hopefully it can help you understand how these mechanics work. Mostly this is for me, I just felt like uh, complaining about it, but I think it will also be very helpful to everyone, because uh, some of these probably are confusing you, and or misleading you in some way, and this can let you get back on track and know exactly what's going to happen when you get into the game. All right, let's get to it. We're gonna start with an honorable mention. I don't think this quite cracks the top five, but I do see people confused about this one a lot, and that is Gloomstalker Ranger. So the issue with Gloomstalker Ranger is the tooltip for Dread Ambusher. You specialize in taking out foes swiftly and ruthlessly. You gain a plus three to initiative, all great so far. On the first turn of combat, your movement speed increases by 10 feet, and you can make an attack that deals an additional 1d8 damage. This part is missing a critical word, and that is an extra attack. Often I see people who think that this just means you get an extra d8 of damage in the opening turn of combat, but that's not how it works. You get an entire extra attack, so you just get two attacks in the opening turn of every combat, and that extra attack deals an additional d8 of damage. The extra attack takes no action to use, so it is wildly more powerful than this tooltip makes it appear at first. Just to quickly demonstrate that, let's go ahead and start a combat here. Doesn't actually matter if we hit or not, but we did. Have to wait for Astarian to very quickly take his turn. <laughs> Just going to spend his actions inspiring people, I guess, and <laughs> casting Longstrider. Astarian not uh, not in the mood to actually help out. Oh, we get an action surge. And Astarian with some foreshadowing for one of the future issues with this, uh, one of the future issues that we're going to talk about. So notice that we have the Dread Ambusher attack. We've used uh, our action for one attack, but we can make a second attack with our second attack action. And then we will be able to use our Dread Ambusher attack for our last attack here. So we get three attacks in the opening round of combat. Weighing in at number 5 for the worst tooltips in Baldur's Gate 3 is a specific item. Now, because this is an item rather than a spell or class ability, I think it's slightly less devastating to comprehension overall than some of the ones we'll be talking about later down the line. But it's actually one of the worst written, and one that is so poorly written that I actually gave incorrect information about it in some of my early videos before I figured out what it in fact did. The item in question is the Staff of Arcane Blessing. This is a very misleading tooltip, because what it says is bless Mistress Blessing, Bless grants an additional 1d4 to saving throws and weapon attack rolls, and an additional 2d4 to spell attack rolls. That's on top of the normal Bless tooltip that says they gain an additional 1d4 to attack rolls and saving throws. What you would imagine, because of the word additional in the Staff of Arcane Blessing here, is that that would turn your 1d4 to everything to 2d4 to attack rolls, 2d4 to saving throws, and 3d4 to spell attack rolls, because the word additional sure implies that it is additive. 
That's not what it does. Instead, it replaces the normal bonus of Bless with the Staff of Arcane Blessing effect. So you get the normal 1d4 bonus to your attack rolls, the normal 1d4 bonus to your saving throws, and 2d4 to your spell attack rolls. So it only really helps for characters that are making spell attack rolls, like, uh, let's say, a Sorcerer with Scorching Ray or a Warlock with Eldritch Blast. Things get even more confusing when you actually cast the Bless spell. Well, let me just equip this staff here so we can actually use it and cast bless on our allies here um actually let me just quickly show you what the percentage chances of hitting are so if we are going to attack uh let's say we're attacking madala here we have a 50 percent chance to hit with our weapon attack and a 50 percent chance to hit with our eldritch blast if we cast bless on ourselves Notice that two different Bless icons show up. This one says you're getting 1d4 to attacks and saving throws, and this one says additional 1d4 to saving throws and weapon attack rolls, and an additional 2d4 to spell attack rolls. The two different buffs here make it very clear that you should be getting an additional 1d4 and additional... Uh, uh, an additional 1d4 and 2d4 respectively um, on top of the normal buff, because otherwise why would it show up as two different blessings? That's like I said, not what happened, not what happens. So when we go to attack, we notice that our chances of hitting with our weapon has increased from 50% to 60%, but our chance of hitting with our Eldritch Blast has increased from 50% to 70%. O the bonus is only applying to spell attack rolls, not to, um, not to normal attacks. Otherwise, the ratio would be uh, 2 to 3 instead of 1 to 2. So you can see that it is significantly worse than the tooltip says it is, and this is an item that people hang on to all game because it looks so incredibly powerful, and if it did what the tooltip actually says it does, this would be one of the best items in the game. As is, it's still very powerful if you have characters with spell attacks in your party, but it is significantly worse than the tooltip makes it look, and people get confused about this all the time, including me in my early videos, um, and this is one that I really like to warn people about because otherwise it confuses them constantly. Coming in at number four is a condition that shows up very frequently during the game. It, you can get it from spells, you can also get it from environmental effects, and the tooltip is extremely misleading because not only does it not in fact tell you what the condition does at all, it also uses a term from an entirely other ability interchangeably when they're very much not interchangeable. The condition that I'm talking about is heavily obscured, which you'll probably see first on the level one spell fog cloud, but there's a lot of other things things that do this, and Heavily Obscured says in its tooltip that you are hiding in a Heavily Obscured area, and you will go undetected unless you get too close to another creature. Some of this is true, but some of it is extremely misleading. Firstly, hiding is a term from a completely different ability. When you're Heavily Obscured, you aren't hiding, unless of course you use the hide ability to become hiding. So just casting Fog Cloud on yourself is not enough to hide. What it does do is mean that you don't have to make stealth checks in order to hide because you are in an area of complete darkness. Heavily obscured actually means that you are in a totally unlit area, so enemies without dark vision are unable to see you. This has two effects. You can both uh, hide without having to make a stealth check unless an enemy has dark vision and can see into the heavily obscured area, and if you're standing in shadows, you get the attacking from shadows buff, which gives you advantage against enemies without dark vision. These two things combined are very powerful abilities, but neither of them are included in this tooltip at all. Um, it does not tell you what it does, and is ex in fact extremely misleading as to what it actually does. So let's cast Fog Cloud and become Heavily Obscured so we can see what actually happens. So if I cast Fog Cloud on Minsk here, we become blinded uh, and don't get the Heavily Obscured buff. You notice that that is not present at all, uh, even though it says that creatures within the Fog Cloud should be Heavily Obscured. Let's go ahead and just make ourselves immune to the blind so that we can show off what's actually happening here without um, the blind interfering with what's going on. So firstly, if I'm just standing in the Fog Cloud and I go to make a ranged attack, uh, I guess I have to uh, 
exit turn-based mode here to get my action back. If I'm just standing in the fog cloud and I go to make a ranged attack, notice that I don't have advantage on either of these attacks because the enemies have dark vision. But if I aim at a, a character without dark vision, they can't see me. So I get advantage on the attack using the attacking with shadows uh, buff. If I then go to hide, so let's go ahead and enter turn-based mode just to make this a little easier, and go to hide, I have to make a hide check against Mizora because she has dark vision. Now that I'm hidden, we will once again have to pass the turn. Now that I'm hidden, I can make attacks against these characters with dark vision with advantage because we have the hiding buff. And if we attack a character without dark vision, we have both the attacking from shadows and hiding buffs. This gets even more complicated because dark vision has a range. So if we back off to uh, a further range of our characters, Then we get the attacking from shadows buff because we are outside of the 40 foot range of the Oathbreaker Knight's dark vision. Oathbreaker Knight has uh, has 40 foot dark vision, which we can see here. So as long as we're outside 40 feet, we get the attacking from shadows buff if we're attacking from an area of complete concealment. Fog Cloud just makes an area of complete darkness on the ground that also blinds everyone in it. It doesn't do anything other than that. It just makes the area that you are in totally unlit. That's the only effect that it has. And so this uh, tooltip is very misleading as to what actually happens when you cast Fog Cloud. It it gets even more confusing if you take a look at the spell Darkness, which also does the same thing, heavily obscures and blinds creatures within, but doesn't include a, a hot link to the heavily obscured tooltip just to make things a little bit more difficult. Because Darkness does also create a totally unlit area that you are supposedly only able to see through using magical dark vision. Uh, if we take a look at our Minsk here, who's a ranger and warlock, you can see that amongst the things that we have is the ability to see through uh, Mag see through normal dark with our superior dark vision ability, but also to see through magical darkness with our uh, devil sight ability. So you would imagine that inside darkness, the darkness spell, you would be able to attack. Um, you you would be able to attack an enemy and gain the unseen buff against an enemy with normal dark vision. Um, however, that's not the case. An enemy with normal dark vision can still see you just fine when you're standing in your um, area of darkness, and you still have to roll hiding uh, stealth checks against them. Um, it's not just the ability to see through magical darkness either. Um, it's just based on their dark vision. Mizora actually has 60 foot hidden dark vision on her character sheet. It's not. It doesn't show up on on her notable features. But uh, we can actually just go ahead and cast darkness out here. And you can see that when we back out of the 60 foot radius, we get the attacking with shadows buff against Mizora because we're outside of her normal dark vision radius. So it's not based on her ability to see through magical darkness that we don't get the buff against her. It's just the range of her dark vision that causes that. So uh, darkness and fog cloud, when it comes to attacking without stealthing, do exactly the same thing. You can uh, hide in them as though you are unseen. Hunting hamsters. Um, because enemies won't be able to, to see you in the in the obscured area, but they will, if you move, have to make uh, stealth checks against enemies who have dark vision, um, despite being heavily obscured, because even though they can't see through magical darkness, it doesn't matter all they're testing against is whether the area is lit or not It for you to make stealth checks and for you to make um, attacking from shadows. Uh, checks. So that's what Heavily Obscured actually does. It gives you the attacking with shadows buff against enemies without dark vision, magical or non-magical, and it allows you to hide without rolling stealth checks if they don't have dark vision. The, it it only creates an, area, an unlit area and doesn't do any of the other things that it says on the tooltip. Weighing in at number three is a spell that we have seen already cast once in this video, and that is the spell Confusion. I'm actually using this as a stand-in for many spells that have this problem, but Confusion is the worst of them, because not only does it have this very basic uh, tooltip problem, it also has an extremely confusing and unhelpful tooltip in many other ways as well. Firstly, let's take a look at the broad issue with Confusion, and that is that it says confuse a group of creatures, causing them to attack at random 
them wander around aimlessly and occasionally skip turns in the stupor. The first issue with this spell is one that is shared by a couple other spells, including Destructive Wrath from Cleric, um, and that is that it says, confuse a group of creatures. In Dungeons and & Dragons and in Baldur's Gate 3, creatures has a very specific meaning. It means everything that's alive, allies, enemies, and neutral characters alike. That is a complete lie in this tooltip, because confusion does not affect creatures, it affects enemies and neutral characters only. You can cast it into combat safely, uh, you can cast it on your allies safely, and they will be unaffected. Notice that my allies are not lighting up, but neutral characters are when I'm using confusion, so if I cast it on a bunch of allies, nothing happens. We're totally safe to do that. If you cast it on enemies, then they have to make the save against the Confusion spell. The same is true for Cleric's Destructive Wrath. You can cast it safely amongst a bunch of allies and enemies, and it won't hurt the uh, it, it won't hurt your allies at all. And it also says creatures, so both of those spells are very misleading for that reason, because people will try to avoid hitting their allies with them and when they don't have to. Secondly, Confusion also just has one of the worst written tooltips around, because it gives you no actual information about what the spell does. Causing them to attack at random, wander around aimlessly, occasionally skip turns in combat, and then it has this helpful highlighting thing, and you'd think it would break down what the odds are of them doing that, or what the actual effect of the spell is, but all it does is repeat the extremely unhelpful tooltip. So not only does this spell mislead you about who it targets, it also doesn't actually tell you what it does. When you actually cast the Confused spell on a group of enemies or neutral creatures, they of course have to make the saving throw. But I can't 100% tell you what in fact does actually happen for these characters. Um, they will gain the Confused debuff. Uh, Withers, of course, is operating in real time because he doesn't enter the combat at all, so he just has to roll uh, the Confusion effect while everyone else is in turn-based mode. Um, another weird thing that happens with Baldur's Gate, but not the one we're talking about today. But when these creatures gain the Confused debuff, of course the Confused debuff just copies the tooltip that we already know from the spell and doesn't tell us what's actually going to happen. If this were tabletop, I could tell you exactly what will happen, and I assume that the Baldur's Gate spell works the same way, but because that information actually isn't ever given to the player, not in the combat logs, not in the tooltips, we don't know with 100% certainty that it works the same way that it does in tabletop. I, I'm pretty sure it does, uh, but I don't think anyone's been able to dig it up from the game files. It's not given in the um, description, so I don't know that this information is 100% accurate. In tabletop, what will happen is a confused creature at the beginning of their turn will roll a d10. On a 1, they'll move in a random direction. On a 2 through 6, they will uh, just remain still, unable to move or take actions. And on a 7 or 8, they'll attack a random creature with a melee attack. And on a 9 or 10, they'll act normally. I think that's also what happens in Baldur's Gate, but let's see what it looks like and whether that is in fact the case. So Lazel is going to go here and then take her turn, and then we'll get to the confused character's turns. <laughs> Just a bunch of weird actions. Uh, Madala Deadeye um, fails a saving throw against Confused, but just acts normally. And then Sir Fuzzlelump also uh, just act normally. So let's take a look at what, what actually happened in the combat log here. So let's back up. We're going to take a look at um, Madala has failed a saving throw against Confused on her turn. Uh, but then just goes ahead and throws a Grease Bottle. Uh, she gains no additional condition. If she had um, rolled whatever it takes to give other conditions, she might have acted normally. Uh, Sir Fuzzlelump failed, but then also didn't receive a, an additional condition and threw a bomb. Uh, let's go ahead and just quick save here, and we can see if we can rotate back to their turns and see if, if they're still confused on their next turn, what, what ends up happening. They both get frightened, or one of them gets frightened, one doesn't. Just wait for Gale's turn to go, and then we can uh, take a look at what's going on with these two. And so here, they got uh, the confused stupor effects, which 
um, randomly appear when the character is confused and cause them to skip their turn. So Madala, uh, so let's take a look at what uh, what happened with Madala. So she failed her save against confused. Uh, so she stays confused for one more turn and receives the confused stupor condition, which means that she just skips her turn. And then Sir Fuzzlelump uh, failed the save against confused uh, or succeeded the save against confused, again acted normally, receiving no condition, um, and then lost the confused condition. So we just don't actually know how that worked at all, how any of that was determined. Was there a role for that? What happened? Why did they th get to act normally three times and only receive a condition once um, out of four attempts? If it was a one in five, like tabletop, you would think that that would be less often. I don't know. I still don't know how Confused works, and I wish they would clarify it. Obviously, the tooltip is extremely poor, um, and we just have no idea how it actually works in the game. Weighing in at number two for the worst tooltips in the game, not only is this one confusing in a bunch of, or misleading in a bunch of ways we've already seen with other tooltips, in that it contains descriptive language rather than mathematical language, um, it doesn't actually tell you what the ability does at all, uh, it also just contains a complete math error. The ability that I'm talking about here is the Wild Heart Barbarian's Tiger Heart. Uh, rage. While raging, you can use Tiger's Bloodlust, and your jump distance increases by 15 feet. Tiger's Bloodlust says, uh, enters a rage that empowers your leaps. You can use Tiger's Bloodlust. I mean, thanks. That's, that's why I'm here. I want to know what that is. And your jump distance increases by 15 feet. Tiger's Bloodlust action says, uh, it does weapon damage and lash out to attack up to three enemies at once and make them bleed. Okay, so firstly, this is a, a bad ability here because it says it has a seven foot radius, but it's not a seven foot radius, it's a seven foot cone. Um, you can see it's got it's got the uh, the radius symbol here, area of effect seven feet. That's not true, it's a seven foot cone. And secondly, um, it doesn't include at all in this description that it halves the damage that you do with this attack. You would think this is just attacking three characters at once for full damage, but uh, Tiger's Bloodlust halves the damage that you do with your attacks. Or does it? Because there's also a, a math error with how this is displayed in-game, so I'm just going to quickly cut to uh, that and I will show you that. When we actually look at the Tiger's Bloodlust attack in-game, it gets even weirder and more misleading. Let's first take a look at our normal weapon attack. We're wielding this uh, in both hands with a versatile weapon, so we do 1d8 plus 8 piercing damage with an additional 1d6 thunder. Now, uh, let's take that's uh, 5 damage from our strength, 3 damage from the weapon enchantment on Nairolna, which has a plus 3. Makes perfect sense, because we have 20, 21 strength for a plus 5 bonus, plus 3 from the weapon damage, uh, 1d8 plus 8, perfect sense. Let's take a look at how it looks if we look at the Tiger Heart Rage ability, and it shows as doing 1d8 plus 18 over 2 piercing damage, plus 1d6 thunder, and then plus an additional 2 piercing. How is this calculated? So first off, the plus 18 is there, and that's correct, because it is including the plus 10 that we get from Great Weapon Master. But then it says that that's divided by 2, and that is a lie. Uh, it then says we do an additional 1d6 thunder, which is correct, and then the plus 2 piercing damage, I'm actually not certain where that is coming from. I assume we have an ability that's giving it us that, uh, but let's see what actually happens when we in fact hit an enemy. I just went ahead and started combat here and skipped to our turn. So first let's take a quick look at um, the, our damage from our normal attack. So we hit the Oathbreaker Knight, did 4 damage on a 1d8 piercing, plus 3, plus 5 strength modifier, plus 10 from Great Weapon Master, minus 2 from Gale's Projected Ward, but all of those calculations make sense and we know where the numbers are coming from. Let's enter Tiger Heart Rage. And then go ahead and make a Tiger's Bloodlust swing. Notice that it is not a circle like the, the tooltip indicates. And we can see exactly how much damage it did uh, when we take a look at the uh, at the tooltip here. So first up, we can see that the um, three plus one d eight, which from one d eight piercing plus three plus five. So our strength modifier, our weapon enchantment, and our damage 
and then those are halved. The additional 10 from Great Weapon Master is not halved, so we saw that in the original tooltip, but that does not get halved at all. And then we add plus 3 from our, our Tiger Rage. Oh, that's where the plus 2 came from, was the Tiger Rage. So that's also just listed incorrectly. That should be plus 3, because we're a level 12 Barbarian in this example. Should it be giving plus 3, not plus 2, as was listed in the original tooltip. So you can see that the original tooltip for, for damage, which shows 1d8 plus 18 over 2 plus 1d6 thunder plus 2 piercing is just completely incorrect because this one is doing um, 1d8 plus 3 plus 5 have that then add 10 then add 3 not 2 uh, and then of course add our additional thunder damage so not only is this tooltip vague and unhelpful it's also straight up wrong and gives it a completely incorrect equation for what actually happens when you attack with it and finally, I've been complaining a lot throughout this video and criticizing, and honestly, the people at Larian do amazing work. The tooltip work in this game is very good overall. Inconsistent, but it's an incredibly complicated game, and you can't get everything right, so it's great when they can fix things. And so I want to highlight that the worst tooltip in Baldur's Gate 3, the most misleading tooltip in the entire game, has been fixed. This issue existed for months after release and was extremely misleading to players about one of the most important spells and most important mechanics in the game, made things extremely difficult to understand how it actually works, and the fact that it's been fixed is great, and now it explains exactly what the spell does. The spell that I am talking about here is, of course, Counterspell. Counterspell uh, says that it's a reaction and you try to stop a spell being cast. If that spell is higher level than the spell slot you use to counterspell, you have to make a check, a normal skill check, using your spellcasting ability to prevent it. This perfectly describes what the spell does, although I will say there is currently a bug uh, at time of recording where instead of using your spellcasting ability, every character uses their intelligence, no matter what their spellcasting ability is. Um, but other than that, this perfectly describes what the spell actually does. For months after release, what Counterspell said was try to stop a spell being cast, and upcasting has no effect, completely misleading players as to how to counter higher spells, higher level spells, and giving them no information about why sometimes their counterspells would fail. Also, when you fail a counterspell, all it says is counterspell failed in the... Um, in the combat log, so there was just no way to know what was happening. That's the great thing about these tooltip errors, is that when there is an issue with a tooltip that's really confusing people, it's a very easy fix. All it takes is a change to text, and so I really wanted to highlight that the worst tooltip in the game, the one that was most confusing and most unhelpful for players about a very important mechanic, is now perfect. This tooltip is great and tells you exactly what the spell does. So hopefully the other spells that, uh, other effects that we've mentioned here can be fixed in the same way. Um, and any that you find, definitely let me know in the comments so that we can report them to Larian and they can get these solved, just as they did for my number one pick for worst tooltip, uh, Counterspell, which has now been fixed and works just perfectly. All right, my friends, I hope that you enjoyed this look at some of the worst tooltips in the game, and I hope it helped you maybe understand a mechanic that was poorly explained by the game. Uh, let me know if you thought any of these worked differently than they actually do, um, and let me know what you think some other confusing tooltips are. As always, if you've enjoyed my video, uh, if enjoyed the video, you can feel free to leave a comment and uh, like the video. Both of those things help me out a ton with the algorithm, so I appreciate you taking the time to do that. And you can subscribe to my channel for more Baldur's Gate 3 and other strategy game content. Cheers, folks. I'll catch you next time.